Over the course of my life, I've walked many miles of railroad tracks in Connecticut. Both abandoned lines overgrown with foliage as well as active lines, all of which were once owned by the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad, commonly shortened to the New Haven. But growing up in the 80s and 90s meant that I never got to see the railroad during its glory days, or any of its days, really. By the time I came along, the company had already been gone for 15 years, and its infrastructure had been ravaged by the Penn Central Railroad and Amtrak after that. Stations were demolished or left to rot, tracks were ripped up or abandoned, all in efforts to cut costs. The landscape has changed so much, it's hard to imagine what the railroad even looked like in the early to mid 20th century. I've often wished for a way to see into the past, at the very spot where I was standing, to be able to see the broken down factories come back to life and to be able to see steam engines flying down the tracks. The main line to Springfield is still made of rails stamped 1942, the year they were forged. It's possible they saw steam service, depending on how quickly they were laid down, but the branch lines, with trees now growing up between the ties, still have rails made in 1884 in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and they definitely must have seen steam. I could have stood next to those very same rails 100 years ago, and been able to see a lumbering tender come around the bend as a steam engine backed freight cars up to the airport. Now, thanks to this game, I have my time machine, in a sense. I can explore the areas I grew up in, but as they were in the 40s and 50s, and on top of that, I get to be the engineer. So today, we're going to take a steam-led passenger train on a guided tour down the line from Springfield, Massachusetts, to Hartford, Connecticut, pointing out places of interest as we go. All right, here we are in downtown Springfield, and we're turning onto Lyman Street. This is the Springfield Union Station. This building was built in 1891 by the Boston and Albany Railroad. This was the third station at this location, the earliest being 1839 when the line was built across Massachusetts. This building is actually technically incorrect for this time period in the game because in 1926, it was demolished and a third Union Station was built on the far side of the tracks and it's more of a uh, Roaring Twenties Art Deco style building as opposed to this gabled turn of the century building. The third Union Station, the one that is not shown here, is the current building and it's being renovated by Amtrak to be reopened very soon. Springfield was an important hub city. It was the center point for three different railroads. The New Haven tracks went off to the south, Boston, Maine owned the trackage to the north, and the Boston and Albany ran right through the middle on the east-west tracks. Boston and Albany was, in reality, New York Central. New York Central had leased Boston and Albany in 1914, although the B&A was allowed to keep their own equipment for branding, but uh, New York Central equipment was seen all the time on the line. This is the trusty steam engine we're going to be taking down to Hartford today. It's a nickel plate road S2 class 284 Berkshire. Running number 751. According to records, the real 751 was built by Lima Locomotive Works in 1944 in Lima, Ohio. She ran for about 20 years before being scrapped in the early 1960s. But today she's back, reincarnated digitally, and we get to climb on board and we're going to drive her down the valley to Hartford. All right, here we are in the cab of our Berkshire. Looking around at our various controls, there's a boiler pressure up at 250, speedometer, and uh, brake pressures directly ahead of us, as well as steam chest pressure in the upper right. Open these windows. First thing I want to do is start loading coal into this firebox. So I'm going to open the uh, open the firebox and turn on the steam for my mechanical stoker. I'm also going to open up my dampers, and I want to turn on my blower, which is that guy right there. There we go, fully open. 
So a mechanical stoker is a steam-powered worm gear or a screw conveyor that as it turns horizontally, it uh, guides coal into the firebox from the tender. Dampers are adjustable doors underneath the firebox because that's where air enters uh, through the bottom of the locomotive. The blower is a Venturi tube up in the smoke box underneath the smoke stack. And what that does is it pulls air through the tubes and out the smoke box so the fire doesn't come out the doors and actually proceeds through the boiler. That's my headlight switch and also my cab light switch, which is not necessary, but I just figured I'd show it. The city of Springfield itself has a rich history. At a site personally selected by George Washington, the Springfield Armory built the very first American firearms and was the largest weapons and ammo depot in the entire country. Many famous firearms were designed and produced there, including the M1903, M1 Garand, and M14 rifles. The armory was closed in 1968 and is now a National Historic Site. Springfield was also the birthplace of basketball. James Naismith invented the sport at Springfield College in 1891, and the Basketball Hall of Fame now sits on what used to be the New Haven Rail Yards. Indian Motorcycles was founded there in 1901, producing the first successful American motorcycle. Dr. Seuss was born there in 1904 and grew up with his family in the city. In the 20s, the only Rolls-Royce manufacturing plant outside England built Silver Ghosts and Phantoms out of Springfield. Granville Brothers Aircraft built famous racing planes like the GB out of Springfield Airport. The city also boasted the first commercial radio station in the U.S. and later the first UHF television station. Alright, I've turned on our Mars light. We're gonna get ready to go here. Mars lights were designed by a guy named Jerry Kennelly, who was a Chicago firefighter. He realized that oscillating lamps catch the eye more than stationary lights do, so he created the Mars Signal Light Company, and fire trucks and locomotives started mounting these lights in the 1940s. Mars lights have since been replaced on modern locomotives with ditch lights, however fire trucks still use them. Two whistles and the bell on means where to go. So. Turn off the uh, stoker, close the firebox, and push our reverser all the way forward, 100%. That's locomotive brake, which is now off, and train brake, which is now released. And we can see that we have zero pounds in the brake cylinders. So I'm going to open the throttle, and we're going to start to move. So we open the cylinder cocks before starting every time to let excess water out. If the cylinders are cold, if they've even just been sitting for a couple of minutes, they can be cold enough to condense some of the steam into water. So now we would have steam inside of our cylinders. Uh, that's not a good thing. Water is incompressible. Uh, we potentially damage the cylinders by having uh, fluid in there. So we open the cylinder cocks. It drains the water out and uh, engineers will watch it. And uh, once it's just pure steam coming out and no water, they will, they will close the cylinder cocks back up because the cylinders have warmed up enough. Take a look at this FA-1 as we pass here in the gold and green uh, paint scheme, one of several paint schemes for the New Haven Railroad. Alco FA-1s were all built in 1947. The only differences between FA-1s and PA-1s is that the FAs are geared for freight and were slightly slower, while the PAs were designed for faster passenger service. In reality, all the railroads that used both units used them interchangeably in both services. So steam engines are controlled with the two different levers that we see here. The regulator, or the throttle, that allows steam into the steam chest, and when you're underway, you set the throttle at a position that you want, either, say, fully open, for example, um, and then you actually adjust speed with the reverser, which adjusts the cutoff to the cylinders. Cutoff is the amount of steam admitted to the cylinders. It measures uh, how long the stroke is, before the valves open and close. So the reverser is used for minute adjustments, right? So you have coarse adjustments with the, with the regulator and uh, fine adjustments with the reverser. So once we get up to speed, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open the throttle um, to 50% first and then later 100%. And then as we speed up, I will bring the reverser back for more efficient steam use and that allows higher speeds also maintains the pressure in our boiler so we don't run out of steam. 
That is the New Haven Roundhouse. That burned down, I think, sometime in the 60s. I wasn't able to find a, an exact date for it. But um, anecdotal evidence suggests that it burned down in the, in the 60s. It would have been knocked down anyways for the construction of I-91, which took place through the 60s and 70s. Uh, Route 91 is a north-south highway, an elevated highway, that would actually be above our heads right now. Um, it follows the river and connects Springfield to Hartford to New Haven. And then also continues north from Springfield through the rest of uh, Massachusetts. That's the Springfield Memorial Bridge. Built in 1922, it connects downtown Springfield with West Springfield. Also, we saw that clock tower that is Springfield City Hall. All right, I'm turning off the blower since we're, uh, we have the throttles open now. The exhaust steam from the cylinders themselves causes a draft through the smokestack which will now pull air through the boiler so we don't need the assistance of the blower anymore but you'll see uh, I will always try to turn on the blower first before I close the throttle because you could potentially get a back draft and uh, get flames coming into the cabin See, I'm pulling back, pulling back on the reverser there. The throttle's only open halfway. We're at 52%, so I'll pull that reverser way back just to uh, maintain speed while we're in the low-speed yards here. Train Simulator doesn't have any examples of New Haven steam power, unfortunately. New Haven Railroad didn't operate Berkshires at all either, but I figured it was similar enough to locomotives they did use to be appropriate. Instead of 284s they used 482s, which were referred to as the R1 class. New Haven used a hodgepodge of wheel arrangements, and mostly because they acquired so many small railroads throughout New England that they took their equipment and added it to their own and put it all into use. Uh, in the 1880s, they primarily used multiple classes of 440 American and 280 consolidated types. Their largest steam locomotives were 2102 Santa Fe's, known as the L1 class. The railroad had 50 of these locomotives in use hauling freight from 1918 up into the 50s. Uh, for the most part, the New Haven made the switch to diesel as soon as World War II ended, having been allowed to buy diesel locomotives during the war. So unlike many railroads, the New Haven didn't have an extended transition period. Almost all steam was gone overnight. All right, here we're coming up on the speed signs. So now we're entering a 60 mile an hour uh, zone through these yards, although we're not gonna go that fast because there's actually a 45 zone before we leave, before we exit the yards. So um, we're not allowed to get up to that speed until the last car of the train passes that, that speed marker. So luckily we only have a few coaches. You can kind of see back there. As soon as that last coach passes, then we'll speed on up to 45 miles an hour. We're now passing the area that will eventually be the Basketball Hall of Fame. Once these yards are all demolished, the, uh, the Hall of Fame is, is built on that spot. What I'm doing now is I'm going to add water to the boiler to maintain boiler levels. And we turn on the water first and the steam second. So the two valves you just saw were for my, um, my exhaust injectors. Steam locomotives have two different injectors, a live steam injector and an exhaust steam in injector. And it, similar to the blower, it's another set of Venturi tubes which uses steam to propel water um, into the boiler. So live steam 
is steamed directly from the boiler, and that costs me pressure. So we only want to use that when stopped, really. You know, or if, if we have an excess of boiler pressure. The exhaust steam injectors, on the other hand, that is steam that has already come from the cylinders. It's already done its work, and it's on its way out the stack. We can divert it and put it to work once again before it goes out the, uh, the smokestack. So using exhaust steam injector, which is what I just opened, we have no pressure loss, and that's the one we want to use while moving. There's the South End Bridge. That's Route 5. It connects the south end of Springfield with Agawam on the far shore. And here's the South Springfield Station. Put the bell on for safety as we go through. This, uh, this was also demolished to make way for the new highway in the 60s. The location is so obscured now. Um, I've walked past this spot many times and I had no idea that there was ever a station here until I played this game, and then I looked into it, and even so, it's it's almost impossible to find any information on it. So here we are. We are now out of the yards. We're 42 miles an hour in a 45 zone. As soon as we come around this corner here, then we're going to be free and clear to go up to 80 miles an hour. So I'm going to open the throttle all the way and then bring the reverser back to between 15 and 20 percent will maintain speed where I want it. And once we hit the 79 mile an hour zone, then I'm going to move the reverser forward to start gaining speed. But I have to find the sweet spot because if I move it too far forward, like I said before, then I will, I will uh, drain my steam pressure and then not have enough pressure to get the train up to speed. The 79 mile an hour speed limit was set by the federal government after a really horrendous crash in 1946 in Illinois. One train rear-ended right into the back of a stop train on a main line doing 80 miles an hour. The law says that now trains must have an automatic cab signaling or an automatic train control system in order to exceed 79 miles an hour. So there has to be automatic gear on board that will stop the train in the case of a red signal or an emergency up ahead. Well, most railroads didn't have that expensive equipment installed, and they weren't really looking to buy extra things. Railroads, especially after World War II, were all losing money and uh, were trying to cut back. So they all decided it was cheaper to set the max speed on all of the routes at 79 miles an hour than invest in further equipment. So that's where the 79 comes from. So we're coming up on the Long Meadow Station. This building was built in 1884. In 1929, the town purchased the building for one dollar, picked it up, moved it across the street. It is still there today as part of the Department of Public Works building. So the last train stop ever was in 1908. So the station should not be there now in this game. It's technically inaccurate for the time, but that's okay. I'm glad it is because I used to hike right by here all the time. And again, I had no idea that there was a station here. And it, I'm, I'm glad that the game included it because now I know. And I was able to do a little research on it and find out more about it. So here's the crossing at Bark Hall Road. Uh, no longer a road, it's really just a pedestrian path now. You can see remnants of the old asphalt, but it really it's all sinking into the, into the muck. I moved back to Enfield, Connecticut in 2006. I lived there for a couple of years, and every day after work I would come down here to this spot and either watch for trains or, or continue down the path and go hiking into the woods.
Alright, so I'm turning my blower on because I'm about to close my throttle. You can see the gauge up there, the, the steam chest gauge up there uh, go down to zero. And we're going to start applying the brakes because we have a 60 mile an hour zone ahead coming into Thompsonville. And you can see uh, the brake gauge on the left. We're at 30 pounds and I'm going to hold it there. This huge complex that we're coming up on now is the Bigelow Hartford Carpet Company. This was once the largest carpet manufacturer in the United States. The company was started in 1828. Most of the buildings that we see here were all built around the turn of the century. The company built significant worker housing through most of the town of Thompsonville, now part of Enfield, including the neighborhood that I grew up in. My mother's house is, is an old mill house built in 1900 by the company for their workers. The mills were closed in the 1960s, and they have now been converted into apartments and commercial space. And here's Thompsonville Station. This is really cool to be able to see what this used to look like, because when I was in elementary school, this was one of the spots I would ride my bike to and watch trains from. And at that point, in the late 80s, early 90s, it was literally just a rubble pile. That's it. But the station was opened in 1844, and uh, the building that we see here built in 1870. The station remained in use until 1971. Penn Central closed it. Uh, like most of the stations along the Springfield route, Penn Central closed almost all of them, um, and then either demolished them or just let them fall to pieces. This building was demolished in 1983 by Amtrak after it had just been vandalized and had caught fire. They just had to get rid of it. Uh, the station stop continued to be in use until 86, and then that was finally closed due to low ridership. So looking down to the right, we see South River Street. Uh, one of the kids that I was in elementary school with, his name was Steve, he lived in that house that's second from the corner, and then his grandmother lived in the house that's actually on the corner. So out in the background there, we can see the Thompsonville Bridge crossing the Connecticut River. Uh, that bridge connected Main Street and downtown Thompsonville with Suffield, on the other side of the river. So that bridge was a toll bridge. It was made in 1893. Once it was closed, it was demolished in 1971. All the metal parts were taken away, but it's interesting because the four stone piers are still in the river. That building that's across the tracks from us, that was the Westfield Plate Company. And they manufactured casket hardware and other dry goods. So casket hardware, uh, hinges, uh, handles, any sort of metal trim. It was all plated metal. That building was built in 1893 and it operated until 1958 when it was closed. Behind the Westfield Plate Company is the Bigelow Powerhouse. And that bad boy was a 4,000 horsepower coal plant that was built by the company to power their massive looms and also to help heat the entire uh, complex. When the mill closed in the 60s, they demolished the building, but the smokestack remained. And for 40 years, that smokestack was a visible icon up and down the river. You could always see where Thompsonville was because of that smokestack. And the, the woods grew up around it, so it was just this uh, stack like in the middle of, of the woods next to the river. In the early 2000s, one night, it finally just fell over. Um, it just collapsed out into the woods, and, uh, and so now that is gone as well. All right, we're ready to go, so brakes off. Reverser forward. Cylinder cocks open. Opening my uh, exhaust steam injectors again. Keep the water level up.
So we can see the end of, uh, at the end of South River Street, if we look on the other side, just across the tracks from that, we're gonna see the bottom of South Street. And South Street was the, the cross street at the end of my block from where I live. So even at age six or seven, I think, I was walking out, uh, walking down the street, and then down the hill to the spot where I would watch trains. There it is, there's South Street. And then up beyond it, we're, uh, we're gonna see a water tower. That actually marks the location of uh, the Enfield Lumber Company, now known as Kelly for Debt. And my house will be right up the hill from there. In fact, that's generally my house right there. That's Prospect Street, that's parallel with the tracks, and then the cross street that's coming up would be Oak, and then uh, Spring Street is right in the foreground here, and that building, or that house on the corner, was our neighbors. We were two houses in from the corner. The lumber company receives deliveries by rail. They, they back the cars into that spur, and then the, the lumber guys unload them, and then they drive them down the road, usually just by forklift. They go down the two blocks to the uh, to the other site, the Kelly for Debt, the actual storefront, uh, and that's where they sell the lumber. So right up here, at the end of the spur, we're going to see a field. It's not built now, but this will be the future site of the high school that I graduated from, Enfield High School. This will be the football field right down here. And then up at the top of the hill, up where those houses are, that's where the school will actually be built in 1964. And this would be the view theoretically from my home room <laughs> or or one of the classrooms on that side of the building looking down over the football field this is the bridge lane crossing and during my senior year some kids i knew were speeding down the road and actually went airborne uh off this crossing and crashed into a tree uh in the front yard of this house they're lucky they hit the tree because if the tree had not been there they would have tumbled right over that cliff and into the connecticut river Right now we'd be passing the Enfield Wastewater Plant, which will be built some years in the future. Affectionately known to locals as the Ship Plant, <laughs> the, uh, the, water, the wastewater treatment plant could be smelled for miles upriver on a warm summer evening if the wind was blowing the right way. So I've got the blower on again. I'm closing the throttle. We got to slow down for a 35 zone um, to cross the river. If we look over there, that's the actual uh, that's the actual railroad crossing, the bridge, the railroad bridge. There's a warning sign for 35. There we go, we'll easily be there, so... Release the brakes here. 
And then we can just coast around the corner at 35 and, uh, and go through the warehouse point station. I used to work right up the road from where this station is. Again, no idea that this has ever existed. Uh, that building right there, that is the only structure that remains. That's the old freight house. It's occupied by a brick company. So this bridge has an interesting history. It was built in 1865, but the Civil War meant that there was a shortage in both material and manpower. So it was actually contracted to a firm in Manchester, England. The iron was brought over from England along with the workers and they constructed this bridge. And uh, it was actually the longest iron bridge in the entire US for many years. It's 1,520 feet long and it's 47 feet from the rails down to the water. So as we look down to our right, we see that we're passing over the Enfield Falls Canal, which was much later known as the Windsor Locks Canal. This five mile canal finished in 1827, and it was built to circumvent the rapids out in the Connecticut River. The canal was prosperous until 1844 because that's when the railroad was built. Uh, even so, they, they still got some use out of it because there was some cargo that was too dangerous for trains to haul, specifically the gunpowder. Um, out of the Hazardville Mills up in Enfield. The canal water also had a secondary purpose of being used as a power source for industries along the canal. So now we're about to come into the town of Windsor Locks with its station on Main Street. Windsor Locks was the town that my family was living in when I was born, so my first five years, that's where I grew up, uh, before we moved up to the house in Enfield. And if we look up there, that is the Suffield branch. That curves around and heads up to both the town of Suffield and over to Bradley International Airport. The small freight yard that we see here uh, was torn up a long time ago. That's no longer there. The freight station is actually I've never noticed it before, but looking in Google Maps, I saw that it is actually still there. It's just hidden out in the weeds. Um, it's, I think it's got some vehicles parked in front of it. So that's kind of still there. The station itself, though, um, is definitely still there. The station was closed in 71 by Penn Central. Again, Penn Central closed every single station along the line between Hartford and Springfield. They just closed everything down. Um, and they were scheduled to demolish this building. A local group of Windsor residents prevented that destruction by working hard to get it onto the National Register of Historic Places. So now the station sits boarded up and uh, the town is trying to get it reopened again as a train station. In 1981, a new station was put into use that's slightly further south from this building. Um, and it was built up as a uh, it's, it just looks like a bus station. It's like a bus bus stop style train station. It's very minimalist and uh, it would be very lovely to see this old building be put back into use again. And there I'm opening my live steam injector to get a little water into the boiler while we're stopped and I've also uh, I also have the stoker going again. This brick building, combined with the white building, is the J.R. Montgomery Company. 
They operated from 1871 until 1989, and they were the country's largest producer of decorative and electric tinsels. So apparently, all the Christmas tinsel in the country came from this place right here. As we look back towards the canal, we can see the path along the side of it. The barges were originally mule pulled, and the mule path has since been paved over and is now a pedestrian and biking path. Five miles long, it follows the canal between this spot right here at J.R. Montgomery, that's where it starts, and then it heads north up to the, the Route 190 bridge crossing the Connecticut River out of Enfield. This complex of buildings that we see here, right along the canal, was the Dexter Corporation. This is Route 140 and the 140 Bridge, which crosses back over the Connecticut River into East Windsor. Dexter started as a family-owned saw and grist mill in 1767 here in Windsor Locks. They became a multinational producer of non-writing paper products. And by that I mean tissues, toilet paper, tea bags, uh, medical garments, things like that. The company operated for 233 years in this same spot. Uh, in 2000, the company had to divide and was merged with three other companies and went out of business as its own entity. The plan is now owned by Alstrom Paper Group, which is a Finnish company. Uh, right there at the that intersection where that little building is, that is currently a Walgreens. That's the Walgreens that my mother works at. And right down here is going to be one of these side roads, is Dexter Road, and my best friend Joel, known him since fourth grade, him and his family live uh, right up this road here. Right up there, I think it's that one. And we pass a marker for 60 mile an hour zone. So we'll let the cars pass it and then we're gonna we're gonna get right back up to speed. Route 159 bridge that we're going under. Alright, I've got everything wide open. Throttle, uh, coal, water. We're gonna get this bastard up to speed. Try to try to break the 80 mile an hour speed limit. There we go, we've hit 70 miles an hour. I'm keeping an eye on my boiler pressure and adjusting my cutoff as necessary to make sure that I don't drop below uh, 230 pounds. I'm trying to keep it between 230 and 240. The safety valve lifts at about 250 or 248 or somewhere in there, so as long as the safety valve is still lifting, we got plenty of spare uh, boiler pressure. This station's long gone, I couldn't even find any info on it. I'm sure it was probably destroyed by Penn Central in 71, along with the rest. 
So the speedometer is showing us a 75, about 240 uh, pounds per square inch in the boiler. We're at 78 miles an hour now. And we're 1.6 miles away from the Windsor Station. Up here, once you cross this bridge, oh, we're right at 80. 79 and a half miles an hour. Eight. 80 miles an hour, just as we cross into the bridge and I have to close the, close the throttle. So now I'm getting on the brakes hard because we gotta, uh, we gotta get down to, I think it's a 45 to cross over the Windsor Bridge. The Farmington River Bridge. Yep, 45. This is uh, 15 miles an hour to go. Look at that, 45 before we even made the signal. This is the iconic Farmington River Railroad Bridge, built in 1867, completely out of stone. This is the station for the town of Windsor, which, yes, is different from Windsor Locks. They're two different towns. This is the original station built in 1870. It survived the 1971 Penn Central Demolition Derby uh, by being bought by the town of Windsor, and they actually refurbished it in 1988 to its original condition. It's now occupied by the Windsor Art Center. Uh, it's no longer a station, although it is a station stop. Trains do stop there, they just don't use the building. The Windsor Art Center also uses the freight station on the other side of the tracks as an art gallery. The whole Windsor Yard is gone. Uh, there's no tracks there anymore, but the station is still there, and so they use that. Beyond the freight station, we see a garage that was built for the highway department in the 1940s. Here, at the foot of Center Street, is the Windsor Company factory, and uh, they produced textile specialties, such as shade tobacco cloth. Shade tobacco, of course, is a huge, huge export for the entire state of Connecticut. That was big business. This building was built in 1882 for the Spencer Rifle Company, but they never ended up using it. It was almost immediately occupied instead by a company called Eddy Electric. Eddy Electric occupied the building for about 100 years or so, that building has now also been converted to apartments. And we look up Center Street here. We're looking into the center of Windsor the old historic center.
get a better look at the freight station and the freight yard. Which has all been paved over, but none of these tracks um, are there anymore. There's a commuter parking lot, as well as a park. Um, and actually on the far side of that road there, they've just finished building um, a whole brand new set of apartment complexes. Off to our right, we see the backside of Grace Episcopal Church, built in 1864. This is the Horner Family Church. I was baptized there as a little baby. My aunt is still heavily involved as part of the admin for the church. The building in the back had a daycare service down in the basement, and I remember watching my very first Amtrak trains going by on this very set of tracks. So we're keeping it slow because we have this express train coming up behind us that we have to pull into the siding for. So uh, the sidings have a 15 mile an hour speed limit and it's right up there just past those signals. That's the island road crossing. So I gotta slow down to 15 here right before we pull in. Let that express train pass us by. Up there on the hill, we see the Loomis Chafee School. The Loomis Chafee School is a college preparatory school, grades 9 through 12. It was established in 1914 by the four Loomis brothers and their one sister. All five siblings had lost all of their children uh, all around the same time. So they pooled their resources and they created the school as a way to give back to the community and to help, help children. And there we go, we're clear of the main line, completely on the siding. And we'll pull up to close to the signal and we'll, we'll give it a stop, put the brakes on. The New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad operated in the states of Connecticut, New York, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. They had a Boston to New York main line that followed the shore, connecting through New Haven and several branch lines, uh, including the, the Springfield branch line, which of course is the one that we're on, goes up through Hartford to Springfield as considered a branch. The railroad was formed in 1872 with the merger of the New York to New Haven Railroad and the New Haven to Hartford Railroad, thus joining all three cities. In 1903, J.P. Morgan acquired control of the railroad. He wanted to create a monopoly out of all New England transportation, so he used the railroad to buy hundreds of other smaller railroads, steamship lines, and trolley lines all throughout New England. By 1910, Morgan and his investors were under criminal investigation for violating state and federal antitrust laws. Additionally, overexpansion nearly caused financial collapse of the company. It was only saved by World War I, when the federal government took over and the United States Railroad Administration ran it. War emergency protections and increased military business got the New Haven back on its feet. The railroad is famous for experimenting in electrification as early as the 1890s, and they were the first railroad to use alternating current high voltage on overhead lines, which is now standard. At the time, third rail direct current was more popular. By 1914, the New York to New Haven main line was completely electrified, which was also a first. With the war over, and the company out of bankruptcy finally, in 1920 control reverted back to civilian ownership. The economic boom of the 1920s allowed the railroad to rebuild worn out infrastructure and equipment that it had been suffering with for years. Unfortunately, the 1930s brought the Great Depression, and the company was soon back into Chapter 7 bankruptcy. 
Luckily, Chapter 7 means that they are in a state of reorganization with protection from creditors. So they were able to make money without having to pay any of their bills because they were still operating. It was during this time that they actually made great strides forward. They introduced the first streamlined passenger trains to New England, both steam and diesel. They bought their first diesel switchers and their modern heavyweight passenger cars. As it was in World War I, when World War II erupts, it's a huge boon for the New Haven Railroad. Because of their location in the industrial north and on the east coast, the New Haven Railroad is considered so important to the war effort that the War Production Board rations them extra materials so they can obtain new diesel and electric locomotives. The DL-109 was an early diesel road locomotive, and the New Haven Railroad bought more DL-109s than any other railroad in the country during the course of the war. When the war ends, the New Haven has the most modern passenger fleet in the entire country, thanks to their being able to purchase locomotives during the war and saving up huge amounts of money so they could buy a whole new fleet once the war ends. 1954 was the beginning of the end of the New Haven Railroad. A man named Patrick McGinnis is voted in as president. McGinnis decides he wants to rebrand the company. He introduces the McGinnis color scheme, which is the black, red, and white color scheme that the railroad is most famous for. Unfortunately, what McGinnis also did was to gut programs, cut services, and defer maintenance. And after only 22 months in office, he leaves the company financially wrecked. Immediately after his resignation from the New Haven Railroad, McGinnis went and took over the presidency of the Boston and Maine Railroad. The New Haven struggled on for a few more years until 1961, when the company once again went into bankruptcy, this time never to recover. The competition from federally funded highways and airlines was too great, as the railroad had always made the majority of its money on passenger service. Heavy industry that had been in New England for 100 years was now leaving and moving south, so even the short-haul freight that the company had gained revenue from was disappearing. State and local governments saw railroads as ready sources of income, and railroad taxes were criminally high. Finally, extensive damage from two hurricanes in the 50s drained what little reserves the company had left. In 1968, the company is no longer able to hold out. The New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad ceases to exist as it is absorbed by Penn Central in a merger. Only two years later, 1970, Penn Central itself goes bankrupt. In 1973, the newly formed Amtrak is given full control over all remaining tracks and structures. So we're proceeding currently under a restricted signal that was the yellow over red. That means that we're uh, limited to 30 miles an hour. However, the express train should be clearing the next block before we get there. So I'm gonna call the dispatcher in a moment. I'm gonna see if we can pass the, uh, the red signal. And if he says yes, that means we can, we're just gonna get right back up to speed. Here we go, request to pass, signal approved.
But that express train has actually cleared the block and is on to the next one. So we're going to crank it up again. The factory we're passing on the right is the Standard Screw Company. They're still there today, they've changed their name to Stanadyne. They produced screws and other fasteners from 1900 into the 1950s. After the 1950s, they diversified into also producing fuel injection pumps for diesels and also producing consumer faucets. miles from the Hartford station. And we're just passing out of Windsor. We're now coming into the north end of Hartford. The street out to our right is Main Street in the north end of Hartford. Now we're passing the Fuller Brush Company, founded in 1906 by Alfred C. Fuller. They sold hairbrushes and brooms door to door. They built this building and moved into it in 1930. The company was acquired in 1968 by Sarah Lee Corporation, and all offices and operations were moved to Kansas in 1973. The building has now been converted for commercial office use. Off to our left is the Meadows Drive-In. It had a single screen. It was opened in 1955, ran for 20 years, was closed in 1975. It was 32 acres, could house 2,500 cars, and had a motorized ride playground for the kiddies before the movie started. We're now entering the Hartford Meadows Yard. That's Windsor Street off to our right, running along the edge of the yard. There are still rail yards there today. They are not a shadow of their former glory. Uh, nothing like this. It's, you know, a handful of tracks, maybe. The majority of the yard, once the rails were ripped up, was sold off and is now home to a large outdoor arena, which is actually known as the Meadows. So there's concerts there all the time, um, and there's a, uh, more of the lands being sold off and, and large commercial businesses are going in there now. Alright, and that red signal up ahead has changed to a 
uh, to yellow. So we're back to restricted uh, at medium speed, so we'll bring it up to 30 as we go through the corner um, and into Hartford Union Station. You can see the engine shops here over on the left. Also in the distance is Traveler's Tower. Traveler's being the insurance company that is their uh, that is the business headquarters and uh, and has been since 1919. This is Windsor Street. We're going we're going over Windsor, Windsor Street and then we'll be going under Main Street as we go through the tunnels. That's Main Street there. You can see the traffic going over. Uh, we're gonna pass underneath it. Route 84 will be to our left in the future when it's built, when it connects, uh, when it connects with 91 and in, in, right in downtown Hartford. That's what the, the interchange is between those two highways. And we're slowing down for a 15 mile an hour speed limit as we round the curve and come into Union Station. Uh, I believe right over there is the brand new Yard Goats uh, baseball stadium. It's the minor league team in Hartford. They used to be in New Britain. They moved recently and renamed the team. Built a whole brand new stadium, which I hear is very nice. I know several people who have gone there now this season. And we're going under Walnut Street. You can see Walnut Street heading downtown into the thick of it. And off that way, that is the uh, that is the Y to the Bloomfield branch. So that branch goes up to the town of Bloomfield, makes a couple of other stops. Back in 1929, that was acquired. That was actually the uh, Central New England Railroad track. That was its own railroad over there that connected here in Hartford. And those tracks used to continue north, up through Connecticut, and then actually reconnected with the Boston and Albany lines west of West Springfield Yards. And then there was actually another spur from Bloomfield that allowed the railroad to go over to Schenectady, New York. And we've got that throttle closed, and we're coming up on the brakes. There's the brakes. With the Capitol building just over our nose in the distance, sitting in front of Bushnell Park. And full brakes and come to a stop. There we have it. Two on the whistle says that we have officially stopped at Hartford, Connecticut at Hartford Union Station. So crossing underneath us is Asylum Street. And uh, Asylum Street is a pretty important and well-known street in downtown Hartford. It leads out from the old State House in Constitution Plaza and then makes its way out to West Hartford. 
It's named for a school that was originally on it called the American Asylum at Hartford for the Education and Instruction of the Deaf and Dumb Persons. It was a school for the deaf, and in 1921, the school actually moved out to West Hartford and changed their name to the American School for the Deaf, which is still out there today. It's actually the oldest permanent school in the U.S. for deaf people. This is the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Arch. Built in 1886, it's a Civil War monument. Since it was only 20 years after the Civil War, there was 10,000 veterans present for the unveiling. This is the headquarters for Aetna Life Insurance Company. The building was built in 1931 and supposedly is the largest colonial-style building in the whole country. I have heard that apparently Aetna is planning to close it down and move away. This is the Colt Armory in downtown Hartford, built in 1855 by Samuel Colt. The Colt Company was famous for its Peacemaker revolvers, the Colt 45 or Model 1911, which was used by the military for all of the 20th century. The Colt Armory was also contracted by John Thompson to produce the first 15,000 units of his brand new Thompson machine gun. This building was vacated in 1994 when the company consolidated and moved their operations to, uh, to a different building in West Hartford. The city is currently looking into doing an apartment conversion on this building as well. And as we fly by the Traveler's Tower once again, over Bushnell Park in towards the Capitol building with Aetna in the background, I want to thank you for joining me on this, uh, on this fun little run from Springfield to Hartford in Train Simulator on the Virtual New Haven Railroad.